Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us today for this very special episode. We're sitting down with Gary Lavox. You might know him best as the lead singer of the Rascal Flats, but earlier this year, he actually released a solo gospel album. And later this year, he's planning on releasing a solo country album. Now, this is a huge episode for me because the Rascal Flats song, How They Remember You, was one of the major inspirations and motivators to why I started this podcast. That song reminded me that it's important to live your dreams, to chase your dreams, to never let them die. And that's what I'm doing with this podcast. And so to be able to sit down with Gary and have some time with him to talk about his career was absolutely amazing. Now, I might seem nervous in the interview, and that's because I am extremely nervous. I'm probably talking too much, not breathing enough, but I did get through it. And it was an absolutely amazing conversation. So please enjoy our time with Gary Lavox. I started this podcast about five months ago in February. Uh, Before that, I was a longtime uh, television reporter for 13 years in my hometown. But the industry changed. And four years ago, I left the industry and went on to other jobs And at the end of last year, I started to get the itch again. And right around that time is when I started hearing How They Remember You. Mm. And every time I heard that song, it kept popping up on my playlists. And every time I heard the line, did you quit or did you try live your dreams or let them die? Every time I heard that line, (laughs) it would fuel something within me and like give me the realization that this podcast is what I was meant to be doing. And so I just wanted to tell you what that song has meant for me. That's awesome. And also full circle. So May 25th is when I submitted an interview request with you thinking that there's no chance it's going to happen, but I'm going to submit it anyways and see what happens. (laughs) May 25th is also the day I went into my day job and handed in my resignation because I was going to focus full time on the podcast. Oh, Brendan, that's awesome. And also on June 7th is when I received the word that I'd get to interview you. And June 8th was my final day at my day job. And so everything has just come full circle. That's awesome, man. This is, yeah, this is destiny right here. It is. My goal with my podcast is to really learn about the journey. And for you, it starts way back, way back Mm -hmm. when you were young uh, in church and Mm -hmm. around the kitchen table with your family on Saturday nights, having family jam sessions. And were your parents like professional musicians in, in any way? Did I read that correctly? No, you know, my dad actually, uh, I, I mean, not a professional musician, but like all through high school, he played lead guitar and lead singer and all that. But, you know, just, I mean, from my grandmother played, my grandfather played, every, just everybody played an instrument or sang or, you know, I mean, all my aunts and uncles and cousins and music was just a part of our life, you know. So what do you remember from those days of those Saturday night jam sessions with your family? Like, what do those memories bring back for you? You know, just some of the best harmony I've ever heard. There's nothing like family harmony, but, you know, just uh, it was it was just, a, you know, it's it's a bittersweet memory because it was so amazing to be able for all of us to be together. And, you know, most of them have passed on at this point, you know, so you just got those memories of, gosh, you know, if I could go back and do it one more time. You know, if I could go back and sing that one song with my grandmother one more time, you know, that kind of stuff. So but, you know, that it really laid the groundwork and the foundation musically and spiritually for my life. You know, and I'm just so grateful for it, every one of them, you know. And you were more of a sports guy growing up, uh, the leading scorer in 86 on your soccer team, I believe. Yeah, 86 to 88. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Soccer was my, my I played soccer, basketball, and baseball. So. Uh, while I was doing that, I was also doing, you know, like musicals and, you know, uh, I was in a concert choir and show choir and all that. So music and sports was kind of went hand in hand. And you have a very distinctive voice now. 
But back then, did you blend in a bit more or did you have a distinctive voice that would stand out amongst the choir? Yeah, I've always had, you know, I've always been a, a first tenor. So I've always been kind of a, you know, I could always sing as high as the girls. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all I've, I've always kind of stood, stood out. And there was an ACDC cover band at some point, wasn't there? You know, and, and it did turn out to be that way, but uh, it just kind of turned out that way. We, we, you know, being kids of the 80s, we loved all that rock stuff, you know, so, oh, yeah. And did you play around or was that just sort of a basement gig that you had with your friends? It, it was just kind of, you know, kind of, if we would go to karaoke, you know, you'd, you'd pull it out and do Edgar Winter or something, you know, and do that kind of stuff. Just, you know, like I said, it was just it was ingrained in us being kids of the 80s. So any chance we had to play it. But we did, you know, some of the little clubs that we played around Columbus, Ohio, we, you know, we'd pull out the rock stuff. Everybody wanted to hear it. So. <laughs> And I saw that one of your first paying gigs was at the Ragdoll Lounge in Ohio. Oh, yeah. Now, what yeah, was man. that gig? Talk about that. Dude, it was it's it just I mean, it was just kind of a hole in the wall kind of place. And uh, some uh, family friends, family of ours was playing in there. And we got up and just, you know, I got up. They called me up to sing. And so I started singing. Then they just started requesting stuff. So they, they actually paid me and. We went in there, and so then I'd play every other weekend or something down there with them, and you know they'd they'd throw me a couple dollars, and yeah, it was fun. It was a blast. And so growing up around the music, with everyone in your family being musical and doing the karaoke thing and doing all of that along the way before you hit twenty seven, we'll talk about that in your mom's kitchen. But before that, was there any inkling inside of you that music was something that you would want to do professionally at any point growing up? Yeah, it, it really was. But I, you know, being from Ohio, I was just like, I don't even know where to get started. You know, I mean, I really don't even know where to get started. So, you know, and it, it, just being from the Midwest and, you know, it was just like, well, you know, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you know, but I just, uh, I just, I didn't know where to get started, really. I, so I, I wanted to, but didn't know how to put the put the wheels in motion. And so what was it about that day sitting in your mom's kitchen, singing along to the radio, that what happened that the, the switch went on all of a sudden at 27 years old? Yeah, you know, it, it was God, man. It was truly a, a, a God moment where I was standing there and I just, Immediately out of my mouth, I just went, God, I feel like you've given me a gift to sing. And I just said, I'm so sorry that I haven't used it. Like, I haven't trusted you enough to go do it. So I was like, you know, and I, you know, Jay's my cousin. And so I kind of hooked up with him and we were talking. And I was just like, I'm putting in a two-week leave apps. I'm supposed to go to Nashville. I, I knew. It was the weirdest thing, Brent. I knew that I was supposed to go to Nashville. And I just... I was like, I'm putting in my two weeks, but there's no way I'm coming back. I know this is what I'm supposed to do. It was the weirdest leap of faith moment I've ever had in my life. And it paid off. Yeah, for sure. What did your parents think when you made that decision? Were they a little surprised by it? Yeah, a little bit. But they were like, you know, because I was like, I just don't think I can live with the what if, you know, what if I would have, you know, I was like, I just can't do it. So I sold everything that I had through my clothes in my truck. We drove straight to Nashville and, um, you know, and that was February of 98. And, uh, you know, all of this great stuff later here, here we are, you know, so I, she, but they supported me a hundred percent and we're just like, you know, there were a lot of times I'd call home and just be like, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know if I can do this. I don't like the starving part of this very much. Peanut butter without jelly is not very good. <laughs> yeah. And when you first got to Nashville, you sang some background vocals um, for uh, a gospel record, Michael English. Now, was yeah. that before you hooked up with Jay, like when you first got there? No, I, I'd hooked up with Jay before that, but Jay was actually producing that record. So I drove straight from Nashville straight to that studio on Music Row and started singing background. So, um, yeah, that's, I wasted no time. So I, I was appreciative of that. and. And then I ended up going on the road singing back up for Michael. And it was just awesome to get that experience. 
And Jay was playing in a Christian band before he started playing in the band with Shelly. Now for mm-hmm. you, because of that and, and hooking up with Michael to s- sing background for him, were you close to going that gospel Christian contemporary route before you swerved into country at all? No, no. I, I mean, I, can't, I wanted to be a country artist, you know, I, I mean, that's just kind of my roots, you know, they kind of go hand in hand, the gospel country, you know, that, that, that they kind of go hand in hand, but no, I came here to be a country artist and, you know, that's, I just, I, you know, I love both genres and I, I love that music. And, you know, I, I think the best singers on the planet come out of the gospel world, you know, and I was always so just blown away by gospel artists. And I was so blown away by the, the timbre of country voices like, you know, Conway Twitty and Earl Thomas Connolly and Randy Travis and just all of that. And then the stories and the, the lyric of the, the country songs was just my whole life, you know, just kind of just how I grew up. So I came here to be a country artist. And, and then the next thing you know, the, a, a band was born. So, <laughs> And you spent a year with Jay singing uh, a lot in the fiddle and steel guitar bar before you guys were signed. And it was basically only a year, right? Because like you say, you got there in 98 and then you signed in 99. So mm-hmm. that year of sort of learning what it's like to be a struggling artist in Nashville, yeah. how important was that to your development and not just going there with this band in mind and getting signed right away, but having to have that year of struggle? You know, it was, it, there was no better training ground on the planet than to do that. You figure out, you know, it's like the voice and American Idol and stuff, you know, they, they really haven't cut their teeth. A lot of the contestants haven't cut their teeth and learning what, you know, you're already, you're automatically, if you make it, you know, you're on the, you're on the front of the world, you know? So being in those little honky tonks was just the best training ground for me and learning how to, what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, cause we worked off of tips only. And sometimes, you know, the true story, we actually made 27 cents one night. Really? Yeah. Yeah. True story. So, uh, you know, you, you just, you, you know, you, you, you really uh, know how bad you want it when you look down after and we played from 9 PM to 3 AM and you look down at the end of the night and there's 27 cents, you know? So it was just the best training grounds. You know, what works, you can read a crowd, you go, okay, I, I see what the, you know, it was just the greatest experience to, to be able to learn and cut your teeth in those clubs and those talky tonks, you know? And for that year, coming from a life, you had already built a life. You had a good job. You had it good. And then spending this year of struggling, like, was it basically daily where you would sit there and think, oh my gosh, what have I done? Have I thrown everything away for this? A lot of times. Yeah. A lot of times. I mean, I'd sit there and I was like, okay, I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to. Lord, I'm trusting you. Come on now. I know this is where you called me to be, but you know, yeah, I'm just every night you'd sit there and you'd, you'd go and we would just, if we weren't playing somewhere, I'd be in there putting in my name on a karaoke list or we would just be just beating it down, you know, just really on the grind and uh, you know, just hard work paid off. And where did the writing come in for you? Cause I know that pretty quick after you moved to Nashville, you got your first cut with Joe Diffie. And yeah. so had that writing, is that something that you had been working on the years before you moved to Nashville? Yeah, I was kind of dabbled in it, you know, but when you're, you know, you move to a town where some of the greatest songwriters in the world live, you know, I just kind of surrounded myself with great people and Lonnie Wilson, who was, uh, I co-wrote that, uh, this pretender with the Joe Diffie cut. I mean, I about passed out when I knew, when found out Joe Diffie was going to cut it and it was going to be a single, so. Um, and then I just started, you know, just started writing with great, great people. And, um, you know, it just, it, you know, I've been so blessed on that side to learn and, and le- really kind of hone and still honing in that craft. It's a craft that you always, that you're always learning from. And, you know, when you write with great writers, it's what you do. You just, you know, you, you add your two cents and whatever aspect, but you really, you know, it's, it's, you just continue to learn and, you know, I'm just so grateful that I've got to write with some of the, you know, some best writers in the world. And what did it mean each time you got a cut on a Flats record? Like, I know I saw that early on in your career, See Me Through 
was one mm-hmm. of the songs that you were proud that you had written and that was on the first flats record and so what did that mm-hmm. mean when you had a cut make it onto one of your own records oh just it just you know it was it was like you know just a part of you is it's one of your children that you're getting ready to put out there into the world you know and it just meant the world to me that you know that that the other two guys liked it and thought that it was worthy enough to be on there and just you know and i you know, everything from I Melt to Fast Cars and Freedom, you know, and then I started getting number ones, you know, that I'd co-written and, you know, it just, you know, it just means the world when you cut your own stuff, but we were never a band that said, okay, well, if we don't write it, we're not going to cut it, you know, and the best song always wins. And I think you kind of put yourself in a hole if you have that aspect, you know, and uh, if you have that outlook, in my opinion, because ask George Strait, his 50 some, he never wrote one of them, so exactly (laughs) you know what the best song wins yeah definitely and so you guys hit the flat stage and i mean we could sit here all day and talk about your experience within the band but we will leave that for another day because we want to talk about the new part of your life and one thing about the flats i do want to talk about is i had the chance to see you guys one time it was in lethbridge alberta canada And Mm -hmm. the night you guys were playing, I was supposed to be going to Calgary to see an NHL hockey game. But Mm -hmm. at the last minute, those plans canceled. And so I grabbed myself a single ticket to the show because everyone else I knew was already going. And so I still have the ticket right here. Oh, that's awesome. And that, unfortunately, your names are not on the ticket. But I will always remember that you were a part of that show because... I didn't know that you were opening and I was sitting oh, yeah. there and all of a sudden the openers come on and I, I had already been listening to your music. And so I was super excited that you guys were opening for him and oh, talk about great. what that tour meant for you guys. And just the support that Toby showed you earlier in your career. I mean, it's huge when you can get on as a, you know, up and coming act and you get on with somebody as huge as, you know, a big headliner like Toby. And we learned a lot and, we tried to steal all of his tricks and, you know, just, I mean, everything from production to, and, you know, when you get the opportunity to get out there in front of so many people and, um, you know, it's just, it's a gift and, you know, and it's just uh, so great for him and Brooks and Dunn and Kenny Chesney and um, Jody Messina. She actually put us on our very first tour. And uh, so just, it was awesome. And we've, you know, once we became headliners, you know, it was real important for us to put those, you know, just to, to pay it forward. And, you know, we've, we had some pretty good luck with all of our opening acts too, that they've all went on to be gigantic stars, you know? So yeah, nice a, little, to have a little hand in it, a little girl named Taylor Swift. I think you guys had a little hand in uh, that. Yeah. 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 Her first tour. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so for 20 years, you guys kill it. 2020 comes around it's time to say goodbye and unfortunately because of the world that doesn't happen now for you coming into that period when you realize that maybe this farewell tour isn't going to happen Mm -hmm. is there anything was there anything inside of you of having to come to to terms with that and sort of thinking who am I now like for 20 years I've been the lead singer of the rascal flats all of a sudden Mm -hmm. i'm not that anymore so did you have to process that at all or were you sort of healthy enough that you did know who you were beyond that uh well you know i'll backtrack a little bit so like september of 2019 joe don came to us and said he didn't want to do it anymore right so uh, he said he wanted to be home and he didn't want to do flats anymore so So we kind of had a a little heads up, you know, so I was already kind of putting things in motion like, wow, okay, that was kind of, I didn't know that was coming. And so I, you know, I was comfortable in myself to know that, you know, I know what my calling is in life. You know, I know what, what, what my gift is, what God's given me to to do. So I I knew I was going to do it. I'd already planned on doing a gospel record, but wasn't sure if I could get to it just because we had so many things planned for 2020. Right. So at that point, you know, it just, when everything stopped, I was like, well, now I have nothing in the way. So I did, you know, this gospel, my one-on-one, the gospel EP, 
And then I just started writing and I've already got my solo country record done. So it's done. And I've got, you know, I've, I've got a song out now called We Got Fight. That's a new Liam Neeson movie that comes out next week. And uh, so, yeah, I just everything just kind of worked out. I just kind of grabbed my pencil and got, got with people, people and just, you know, I, I made two records. So, you know, I just I was comfortable in knowing what I wanted to do, you know, and. But, you know, Jodon with Jodon not wanting to do it anymore. You know, I kind of had a little heads up. And so I had the wheels kind of already rolling, you know, so it wasn't like just, okay, the whole world stopped. And now what? You right. Know? Yeah. So. And the distance, was that the first song that you wrote? Is that what kicked everything into gear for you? Was that song? Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Cause you know, when I wanted to do the, the, the Christian record, I was like, and at that point it was so early on, it was like, you know, every, so many questions about COVID and every all the, everybody dying and what's going on and being a father, you know, you, you want to have all the right answers for your kids. And it was like, man, we've got to, there's, I've got, we've got to have something about, we've got to put a little hope back into this world. And uh, you know, there's no better medicine than music. So this is, that was the first one that we wrote myself, McVie and uh, Josh Hogan. So it was just saying, look, you know, all this is too big for us, but, you know, uh, just, you know, you just have to give it to God. We're going to have these speed bumps, cracks and detours, but, you know, with God, you can go the distance, you can finish the race. So that was, that was the first song and that's the, the single out now. So I'm yeah. so thrilled. And the stories have been great about, you know, just, I mean, from uh, you, the stories go on forever on what that song is meant and what it's you know it's like man i didn't want to go to work to that police officers you know they're like man this song is really let me know that you know i'm gonna get through it i'm gonna make it so it's been great yeah that must be a pretty big thing for you as a songwriter and a performer to have a song hit as hard as it does like i say for me it was how they remember you it helped me to mm -hmm. drive this podcast forward and so it must be really cool to hear those stories because at the end of the day that is your goal right to affect people in that way with your music yeah it's all that matters it's all that matters yeah it's all that matters is you know that you know you you touch somebody or give them some hope or you've told their story through song and The Distance is the only song on the EP that doesn't have a feature on it. So is there a mm -hmm. reason for that? Like, was that just such a, a powerful song that you just wanted that to be your introduction to the world as a solo artist? No, I, you know, not really. It just kind of played out that way because I, you know, I was just, I was just like, you know, there, there are no rules. And, you know, I'd already, cause since that was the first one that I wrote, it's the first one that I sang. So that was already kind of done and put away. And then you know, my daughter, Brittany's on there. And that was a song Torn Wells wrote. And then, you know, Mercy Me and, uh, you know, Jonathan McReynolds and Brie, some of my favorite singers. And it just, you know, it was just just the way that it worked out. And, you know, I'm so thrilled to have all the there's such amazing talent on that on that uh, EP. And with your daughter, I saw a post from 2018 on your social media that she had gotten up and sang my wish with you on stage in West Palm mm -hmm. Beach. And it looked like from the post, that was the first time she had ever been up on stage with you. And mm -hmm. so an experience like that, as opposed to her singing on this album, do they compare at all to the feeling uh, of what that's like? Oh, I mean, as a dad, you just, you know, you just want to cry every time they do anything good, but they, you know, she, she loves it. Both of my daughters, Brooklyn too, they, they absolutely have an amazing gift to sing and, and, and they, they just, they, they love it. You know, they've lived it their whole life and, and uh, I'm just so proud of both of them. And they, I mean, they really, really have an amazing gift. They blow me away. They absolutely blow me away. And I'm not saying that as like a, just a proud dad, but I mean, when, when I dissect what they're, how they're saying stuff, I mean, it's really strong. They really got the goods, man. <laughs> and since 2007, you've been out on Freedom Farms. Now, do you have a setup there? Did you record this album at the farm? I did some of it. Yeah. And I actually sang in my laundry room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of the vocals were done in my laundry room. Yeah, because it was the quietest place out here. 
Right. And I know you took uh, the artwork, the album artwork out on the farm. What did that mean yeah. to be able to do that and have it so personal and just have the comfort within that for that process? Yeah. You know, it meant the world to him because I, you know, I'm such a huge outdoorsman and this, my whole life is out here and I, I you know, I, I love the outdoors and I'm a big hunter and fisherman and I just, you know, I take so much pride in my dirt out here and I, I just you know it's what I always wanted you know and so to I mean this is such a huge part of who I am that you know to be able to capture that and uh you know it just it just it meant the world to me it really did and uh because this is this is my this is my safe place you know this is home base for me and so to kind of let everybody into my personal world too you know it's it was really it was really fun and recently you got to play the Opry for the first time as a solo artist. Now, being a member with the Flats, like what was it like as a solo artist? Was it a different experience for you? Did you have different feelings than the countless other times you played it before? Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, a little bit, you know, because, you know, we, the three of us always wanted to be members of the Opry. We really worked hard on achieving that goal and, you know, it was, it was a little different, you know, it's, it's the same feeling because you just have so much pride in being a member of the Grand Ole Opry and how much that personally means, you know, to, to me and to them. And, you know, but yeah, to be up there, it's like, as a solo artist, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was very humbling that, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm exactly where I need to be. So it was fun, man. And over the next 20 years, if you play enough, can you become a member as a solo artist? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's unbelievable. I don't know. We'll have to see. I don't know. I don't know if I, it's funny because everybody's like, man, now you're a solo artist. You might be able to get into female vocalist of the year categories. I don't <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And throughout 2020 and into 2021 here, do you ever think as to where you would be if you didn't have this new music to to take you forward if you were just kind of there on the farm with nothing yeah well you know that that was that was an option too you know it was an option too but you know i just uh you know i love it out here so it, it's you know I, I, I would have been fine doing that just being out here running the farm and hunting and fishing you know i would have been fine with that but you know, I just feel like my calling is more than that. You know, I think, I think God's still, I think the stage is still my platform and, um, you know, I, I still need to, I still have a lot of insight in my heart. I still have a lot of things I want to say musically and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful that I got the opportunity to do it. And, um, so, you know, thankful to Scott Borchette and everybody at Big Machine that, you know, believed in me and it's not, I'm still a big machine and nothing changed. And, you know, we just got to work. So, you know, I just, uh, it's been a, it's been a fairy tale, man. And I'm, I'm ready for this, this new chapter and this new season is going to be a blast. And talk about the country music that you have coming. Can you give us any insight into when we can expect it and what we can expect from you? Yeah, hopefully this fall. Uh, it, but it's, I, I've got some songs on there that are, I mean, it's, it's, they're really, really strong. And, um, it's just, you know, I, I, it's hard to say that, okay, it's not going to, it's going to sound nothing like flats, but when you've been the, the face of flats for 20 years, it's going to sound like that, but it, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we would have cut these songs or not, but uh, you know, it's, I, I'm so proud of the project and um, you know, I, I think the, the quality of the songs and I mean, it's fun and it's just really kind of a roller coaster. There's a great up tempo stuff on there and there's just, you know, of course, amazing ballads and awesome mids. And uh, it's it's exciting. It's an exciting time in my life. And I'm thrilled to have this new music coming out. So hopefully in the fall, we'll drop it. And do you have co-writes on that album as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Co-writes on that. Me and Neil Thrasher and Wendell Mobley and Tony Martin, Lee Miller. Uh, a lot of a lot of big ones on there. So, yeah. And now in 2021, are you starting to get some dates in the works? Can we uh, expect some some dates that you can tell us when you'll be on the road? Yeah, you know what? They're, they're kind of wrapping it all right now, but I'm going to start 
I'm going to start and I've got some private things to do this summer. And then uh, I'm going to start a start touring. I probably I think I've got 15 from like September to the end of the year. And the next year, next year, I'll be back out and probably do 30 or 40 shows. So the tour is coming. Yeah. And when you first hit the tour, do you think there's like, is there going to be a different feeling than ever when you've hit the stage? Because there has been this break. Do you think there might be some butterflies getting back out there since it's been such a long break for you? Yeah. I I mean, there's always butterflies, but it's more, you know, it's just adrenaline, but it'll be, it'll be on level 12 when I hit the stage this time. Yeah. Hopefully I don't run out of breath by like the third song and I got to sit down and take a break, but uh, yeah, it's, we'll be going a thousand miles a minute and, uh, we're going to bring a show. And talking about going a million miles a minute, I know you're busy on the farm. You're busy with your music throughout the past year. Have you taken time to sort of sit down and reflect on the career and, and what has happened and, and how you want to take that and move forward? Yeah, I, I have a lot actually. And, uh, my wife and I've talked about it a lot, and, you know, cause a lot you know, the, the biggest part of my adulthood was spent uh, with Jay and Joe Don in that band and, and doing, I mean, a lot of things that we did in our careers, Rascal Flatts was the first. I mean, we were the first to ever, first country band to ever play Wrigley Field and sell Wrigley Field out. And just, I mean, we had a lot of first, you know, a lot, I mean, we broke our own attendance records at some places, you know, I mean, just unfathomable goals that were accomplished and that far exceeded it. So, you know, it's, it's sad that that chapter's closed, but you know, I mean, you have to respect, that's the one part about being in a band. You have to respect what the other, the other two guys, you know, uh, you know, everything you do, it's kind of a, it's a marriage, you know, and if Joe Don didn't want to do it, we had to be respectful of that, you know? And, uh, but it, it, it's sad. I wish it would have, you know, I wish we could have finished the farewell tour the right way. And, you know, I wish we had control of that. And, uh, but you know, who knows? down the road somewhere if something comes back up you never know but um yeah i mean it's you know it was such a huge part of my life for so long and you know uh i know i'll i'll miss i'll miss doing what we did and you know but now it's just it'll be me doing the flat stuff and you know without the other two guys and they're they're all living their lives and uh you know so i'm gonna carry the torch and move forward yeah because on the road you're gonna basically have the flats band with you right yeah, yeah, they're all it's the same band. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, just uh, a different guitar player who and Andy. He he actually played with us before, and then uh, uh, this new bass player that's out of this world. He's unbelievable. And uh, but yeah, all all my my keyboard players the same, drummer same. Tra- yeah, so it's same Platts band. So we'll, we'll be rocking. <laughs> and you guys are receiving the Icon Award at the ACM Honors. Yes. How does that feel? Like, is that a pretty good way to sort of put a bow on the journey to receive an award like that at this time? You know, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think just being even considered or called that, or, you know, people just, uh, you know, just the reflection of what we've been able to do musically for 20 years. I mean, it just, that's, it's such a huge, huge, huge honor. And, um, you know, I, cause it, it's weird. Cause I, I, that 20 years went by so fast and I didn't even feel like a 20 year old act, you know, I mean, it was all still felt like a, like a new act really to me. I mean, I felt that way, you know, I was just excited to go do it all the time. And, you know, so it's just amazing how time flew by and then to be just so humbled to be considered into to be getting this icon award is it just blows my mind man it just it really it just it humbles me to a place that i never could have dreamed so it's uh it, it's a huge 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 honor and how proud are you of yourself not just the flats but of yourself looking back at that 27 year old sitting at your mom's kitchen table with this dream and just trusting in that dream and now looking back and saying, I did it. Yeah. I, you know, I just, uh, I just thank God that he, you know, he, <laughs> that I took the chance. And I just thank God, God that he, he never left my side. And, 
um, you know, my family and just everybody that supported me all along the way and that, that, that kept pushing me when I wanted to quit. And I'm just so glad that I didn't. I'm so glad that I never quit, you know. Uh, I just that's not in me. You know, there were a lot of times where I could have and felt like it wanted to and would just scratch my head like, oh, I can't believe this is, you know, this is so hard. And uh, but I'm just, you know, just so thankful that if it was my mom or my wife or who that were just like. All right, let's go. You got to get a, we're going to push through this and, you know. So it's, you know, show business is a, is a roller coaster. And I'm just so glad that I stayed the course. And I'm just so glad that I, uh, you know, I, I just stuck with what I knew God had called me to do. And, you know, I crossed one finish line and about to hit the starting line to another race. So I'm ready to go. Well, those are amazing words because I know that just hearing that from you inspires me just like your songs do to keep going. And so thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Like I say, it really is a full circle moment for me on this podcast. And I I can't express how much it means to me to have you on here and uh, for you to take the time. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Brendan. And hey, congratulations on not quitting, man, and just and going, you know, just just doing what you do, just going. Because, you know, it's funny because we, we all want to be in control of our destiny and, and we're really not. But as long as we can just keep putting one foot in front of the other, it, it, it'll work out. You know, it'll it'll work out. You can go the distance. See what That's I did right. there? Exactly. I saw you that. can go the distance. That is amazing. Well, thank you so much. The new album, One on One, you can listen to it everywhere you stream. And then we will look so forward to the solo country album, hopefully in the fall. Thanks, man. Thanks so much, Brandon. Thank you. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon when the new music is out. Yeah, brother. It's a privilege. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you guys once again so much for listening to this very special episode. And thank you once again to Gary for stopping by, for taking the time to talk to us, to really make a dream of mine come true. His music has really been an inspiration for me and continues to be an inspiration in driving me forward in producing this podcast. And I can't thank him enough for stopping by and taking the time. Please make sure to check out his new album, One on One, wherever you stream your music. And please also make sure to like, share, follow, subscribe to us on whatever streaming platform you're listening on and head over to social media. Give us a follow there as well so you can stay up to date on all the exciting interviews that we have coming up in the future. Thanks once again for listening and we'll see you next time on The Music Made Me. (laughs) 